story called Psychos. I was at work when I got a call from my dad, so I couldn't pick up. While waiting to see if he would leave a voicemail, I looked across the hall, over my coworker's shoulder, through an empty office, and out a window. The weather was bright, almost washed out, and I could see a large American flag doing the boogie in the wind. I'm going to take a break, I told a coworker as I began to put my jacket on. Outside, I walked past a huddled group of Russian smokers. The Russians worked for the U.S. outpost of some Slavic software company on the fourth floor of my building. They migrated around the financial district in packs, looking serious and stark in natural light. Near a jagged and abstract fountain, I listened to my dad's voicemail. Well, she found out, he began, and then continued swiftly. I'll beat you to the punch by admitting that I'm a dumb motherfucker, and yes, she screamed and hit me before finally making some sense and saying she wants a divorce. I listened, somewhat unmoved by all this, as I knew about the affair and the inevitability of it being discovered. I've got your half-brother with me, my dad said, before he hung up. When the elevator opened, I stepped inside. When it opened again, I leaned away from the wall and walked on my floor. I took a hard candy from the receptionist's desk. How's the weather out there, she asked, as she asked every time I came in. Smoky, I replied, mimicking a cigarette in my hand, the Russians. Ew, the receptionist said. I walked down the long hall to my boss's office, past the ugly art on the walls, and knocked on her door. I just got a call from my dad. I guess there's a family emergency. Oh no, she said. Is everything all right? I liked my boss. I sometimes imagined her 15 or 20 years younger, her body tighter. I did this because I only had to work 60% of the time I was at my job to accomplish my responsibilities. My boss wasn't in charge of the whole company, just my division, and she prided herself on advocating for us. Can I take the rest of the day off, I asked. Absolutely, she said, no question, family comes first. Her face was attractive when she looked concerned It forced the muscles to flex and lift. Thanks, I said, thanks a lot, I'll, I'll be in tomorrow. Someone had broken into my car a couple weeks ago and stolen my stereo. They must have been idiots or fetishists because I only had a tape deck and I could not believe that the man on the black market was high for this kind of outdated technology. I didn't feel much like talking to anyone on the way down, so I turned my cell phone off, entered the freeway, and drove for two hours in silence. Well, actually, I said Jesus a couple times, but only because there were so many bad drivers on the 101 this afternoon. Nearing my dad's house, I began to smell smoke. He and my stepmother and my half-siblings lived near the top of a small rural canyon along the central coast of California. It was autumn, and the smell of seasonal burn fit with the cool, crisp weather. Even though I had never had one, a vision of a Starbucks pumpkin spice latte appeared in my mind as they had recently stepped up their advertising campaign in the subway tunnels that I used to commute to work. I climbed slowly on the black, narrow road. Through a forest of familiar live oaks, the house soon came into view. My dad was in the driveway, pushing an old hutch that had once been in the living room into a growing bonfire. I slowed down, and from an open second floor window, I saw my half-brother. He whistled at my dad, and then held up two books. After quickly evaluating them, my dad gave a thumbs down, and my half-brother dropped the books into the fire below. I parked the car on the street and walked up the driveway. Through the bright flames, I could see the frame of a couch sitting under a bunch of burning clothes and my dad's old skis. What the hell is this? I asked, squinting my eyes from the smoke. Fresh start, my dad said. Hey, you made a good time. You think your wife is going to approve? I asked. Ex-wife, he corrected. Well, soon to be anyway. I'm just burning my stuff. I'm just fucking cleansing myself of worldly possessions. I'm just better off this way. Simplicity is my new mantra. My half-brother jogged out of the wide-open front door and said hey to me. He was 11 and already looked a lot like my dad, which meant he looked nothing like me. He put his arm around my waist and in a concerned voice asked, How are you doing with all of this? I laughed and then put my arm around his shoulder. I was 15 years older than him. I'm supposed to be asking you that, I said. I'm like an old pro at this kind of thing. Oh, he said. But thanks. I appreciate your concern. I'm doing well. Whose idea was the fire? Dad's, of course, my half-brother said. He's a total pyro. Well, don't just stand there, my dad then yelled to us. 
towed me out. I'll be back in a sec, I said, and walked to the street in my car. In the trunk, I had a gift from my half-brother that I had been meaning to give him. When I returned to the fire, my dad was sorting through a dusty cardboard box, adding piles of yellowing paper to the blaze. Do you need a permit for this kind of thing? I asked him, glancing at the neighbor's houses. I don't fucking know, he said, and he looked up at me. At that moment, he appeared both young and old. His hair was more gray than the last time I had seen him, but the bewildered look he displayed was that of a confused boy. My half-brother walked up to us. Uh, well, this is interesting, he said in a sensitive but also slightly sarcastic voice. I could tell that he had only a very small idea of what was going on. Here you go, psycho, I said, handing my half-brother a sweatshirt I had bought him. What, my dad said? He was looking away, restraining to hear. Oh, cool, my half-brother said, holding up the sweatshirt. It was one of those cheap hooded sweatshirts that you can find in Chinatown. On the front of the sweatshirt and in the large font, it read property of Alcatraz Psycho Ward. Can I get one of those, my dad joked? I'll outfit the whole fucking family, I said. Then I laughed and looked down at the ground. Shit, excellent, my dad said. Hey, the rest of this box is pictures from my first wedding. You should keep it. Your mom looked beautiful. Okay, I said. All right, my dad began. I need two strong men to lift the file cabinets in the garage. My dad's file cabinets contained a wide variety of information and knowledge from throughout the ages, everything from old bills to articles on faraway places he wanted to travel to small, wallet-sized school pictures I would send him when he was living on the other side of the country. In the garage, my father and I bent down to lift the unit while my half-brother stood nearby as an ornamental navigator. Shouldn't we just take everything out first, I asked? It'll be faster this way, he said. I was feeling both angry and sympathetic as I strange, strained to lift the giant cabinet. Fuck, my dad and I both exhaled. I realized that we were and would always be related. As we inched our way out of the garage and towards the bonfire on the driveway, I could hear the sound of a fire engine. Uh-oh, my half-brother said, Dad. Almost there, my dad replied, invisible to me. My entire field of vision was taken up by the file cabinet. I think I need to set it down and take a break, I puffed. Come on. No. The heavy load was preventing us from speaking in anything more than grunts. We were barely moving, and I could feel my arms begin to go elastic. The sirens grew louder, the closer. Okay, my dad then said, sounding out of breath and tired. We dropped the file cabinet ten feet away from the fire. I looked up and saw a small fire engine. Turn onto the street, sirens wailing. My half-brother retreated into the house. My dad was breathing deeply and sweating. He was bent over and his hands were on his knees. That wasn't as easy as I thought it would be, he said, as the firefighters ran to extinguish the flames. Thanks.